a really strong working group, but we're also doing community engagement with other groups who may not be represented by us and with whom we don't think we can talk on behalf of. Um, so for example, we've got a difficult, tricky, and I'm going to go so far as to say blatantly racist object downstairs in our local history gallery. That is uh, a fortune telling machine of the pier. The pier is our context, it's metaphorical really for, for the idea of Sussex and the exhibition does extend as far as Sussex though obviously we have particular interests in Brighton. Um, but we are looking at the pier as a starting point for queer history there. Um, one of the objects we have downstairs it, uh, gives us a way of engaging with the permanent collection. I guess one of the tricks with curating queer history projects is that a lot of our history has been not been saved or it's been overlooked. Um, so it takes an, a really, really, really deep dig to be able to find it. Um, but what we're very interested in doing is engaging with the permanent collection here. And some of the objects we have in the permanent collection may not have queer history, but re may resonate with people who are involved in the group who want to respond to it and inject queer history into it, um, or they may in fact have queer heritage themselves. So this object downstairs is a fortune telling machine. Uh, it has a character inside it with a turban, uh, it has a third eye, uh, and up the top, spelt in English rather than Romani is the word gypsy, G-I-P-S-Y. We're working with local artist, Worthing artist, Delaine Labas. Uh, who is a Roma activist and was responsible for starting the first ever uh, 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 Roma pavilion at the Venice Penale. Um, so she's a really, really established artist internationally. And she's engaging with the local Roma LGBT community to come in. We've located the original fortunes that came out of the fortune telling machine. And in a workshop community environment, they're going to rewrite them through a queer lens and inject their own history. And we're looking at getting the machine fixed so that actually what you're going to get out of it are the local oral history <coughs> and the queer Roma community. So it's history making as well as history taking and a way for us to engage with the permanent collection. We've also worked with private collectors um, and we're going to hear a bit about that today as a way of finding local history. Um, one of the ways that we would like to engage with the broader queer community is by running a project, an online campaign, where you send us photos of you at the pier, queering the pier. And we're going to start a digital collection of the photos of queers on the pier. Um, and we're hoping to commission a new work that I've got news to tell you about as well. So we're working on that idea where people will be able to send through to our Facebook page, which is about to be launched in our Instagram account, um, photos of them queering the pier. And in fact, this is Darren here, a photo of him on the pier. What year, Darren? Um, 1992. 1992. So please do go through your drawers. That's not a metaphor. <laughs> and send us in your photos or take new ones because this is, as I say, history making as well. We've had some success with local news. So the Bishopsgate Institute, again, uh, working with partners who have queer collections as well is, is one way of, of finding the research that we're after. And I've been down and spent some time at the Bishopsgate and we'll be there more, I don't know if you know, but they have uh, probably the largest, most important queer collection that's still collecting archive in the UK. Um, it's of particular importance because it's a radical archive. So they collect banners, protests, social history. Um, it's not just uh, fine art, if you like. So you'll find lots of badges in there alongside things that have traditionally been considered worthy of the archival environment. And they have the lesbian and gay news archives there. And in the lesbian and gay, uh, Steph, who curates the archive, was um, telling me that when he uh, decided to accept the collection, he thought it was going to be a couple of folders. They turned up with a truck with 13 filing cabinets. Basically, every, for, since the 60s, 
every single newspaper article that has, has had something to do with LGBTIQ has been saved by community members who've been part of this project and scrapbooked. And so it is the most extraordinary collection of queer news um, over about 50 years. And sure enough, when I went down, they have a whopping big Brighton file. So I, my problem at the moment is what not to use and how to display it, essentially. It would make a fantastic, huge wallpaper, but of course you've got the problems um, of licensing, whether the newspapers will let us use it in a public display, whether they want to charge us for every article that we do use. So if it's 50 quid a pop, we could easily spend five grand, so that's never gonna happen. Um, but it certainly is really interesting because it traces everything from murders and attacks and violence, because of course the Argus wants to pick that kind of thing up. Um, there's strong social protest evidence in there so the first all women's march that happened um, so it's really great to see this women's history and um, this is for international women's day but there's lesbian history specifically in there as well it's hilarious stuff <laughs> like the gay priest who doesn't carry a handbag um, i just have a lot of time for that one so it's this process um, of of going through archives we're spending a lot of time out at the keep uh, we're running the social media campaign to try and create new history. We're trying to engage with the permanent collection as well here in Brighton Museum. And rather than me talk the whole time, we've got our team of community curators here. And each of them is going to go through some of the approaches they've been doing with their research and talk to you about some of the findings they've come up with. Thank you, EJ, for leaving that picture up. Um, that is actually me last night, so I want, first of all, I want to first of all apologise. If it looks like I'm shaking, it's not because I'm nervous, it's because I've got delirium tremors. Uh, that was me co-hosting the Fever Club last night at Spiegel Tent. As um, EJ said, we did start from this position. Um, we're here, we're queer, we're on the pier. If you look at any old photograph of the pier or the beach, um, you can, you know, you, you, we assume that everyone's straight, but of course they're not. It's just that you can't really see us, where we're hidden. But we've already always been here. And I think the part of this exhibition is really to help visitors to, to look a bit closer and to see that we, that we have been here, um, not just the last 40 years, but for, for, for decades and decades. And the, the theme with the pier, and I know I'm going to touch on some of the stuff that, that EJ has said, but we are looking at LGBTIQ plus history through the lens of the Palace Pier, because we've got loads of artefacts from the Palace Pier. So in an ideal world, what we want to do when you, when you get to this exhibition, we're recreating the excitement and fun of the pier. So it will be interactive, there are going to be arcades, there's going to be lots of opportunities to touch and feel what's in there. It's going to be a very, very busy and hopefully noisy and possibly even smelly um, <laughs> uh, uh, exhibition, pumping smells of donuts through or something. Um, and we are, as we said, we're going to be using objects from the museum, from the Keep, from private collectors um, in Brighton and beyond. Um, and it will cover ephemera objects, audiovisual film, blah, 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 blah. So it's going to be very, very, very busy. So more is more is definitely the theme. And we are going to be covering about 250, 300 years of history from Sussex and especially Brighton. And we're obviously going to be uh, ticking off some of the people that have to be there, Gluck, um, Aubrey Beardsley um, and Maisie Trollette, the oldest drag queen um, in the country, I believe. Um, but also, really importantly, we're going to be telling the stories and the lives of ordinary, or I think extraordinary people, like you guys, um, who have made Brighton their home um, over the last few years. So, um, I'm a community curator, that is shorthand for volunteer, so I have no <laughs> background whatsoever in, um, in all this stuff, so it's been a very steep learning curve, so thanks to EJ, I've picked up a few things, um, not literally, because that tends to be frowned upon, <laughs> and easy, um, unless you're wearing white gloves. Um, but no, I, I think one thing that really sort of hammered home is you don't start with the narrative, you start with the objects. You start with the ephemera and you look at the objects and you let the objects tell the story. And we're kind of at that stage now where we've got about 250 objects, ephemera, whatever, where we're starting to create some of those narratives. And it's actually some of those narratives that I want to sort of just touch on today and give you a, a flavour of where we're at at the moment. So I think a big question is, and we touched on it, why is Brighton and Sussex so fabulously gay? Why is it so queer? Um, and I think, you know, if we go back um, 
I think, well, again, as, as, as EJ said, we, we're not going to force a view down. We want people to come out of the exhibition and, and, and create their own ideas of why that is the case. Um, but, you know, there are some points. And I think if you go back right to 1750s when Dr. Russell talked about the curative properties of, of the water down here, you already have this place that's sort of all about alternative um, thinking. And if you throw in a few Turkish baths, a race course, lots of gambling, some assembly rooms, and you can see why the Prince Regent wanted to come here to get away from his dad. Um, and then obviously once the Prince Regent comes here, you, with these coterie of dandies, you're bringing down all those professions that supply these people. So we are talking the slightly more artistic professions, so dressmakers, tailors, people who work in the performing arts, theatrical types. So you can start to see that you know, there is a bit of a draw to this town. Um, and then throw in the fact that during the Napoleonic period you had a large uh, assembly of military men. Um, and you've got quite a recipe for something interesting going on. And, you know, of course, in this period, there's nothing that we found that absolutely says that there's a gay presence here in this town. But um, we, we, did, we did find this, um, well, actually, EJ found it in a box at the key, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And I will, I will read it out because it is brilliant. It's basically uh, the transcript from a court case um, of someone who has uh, exposed themselves on the beach. And it says... Um, on a certain Sunday in July 1808, the defendant was prosecuted for indecently exposing his person at Brighton. Within a few years of the offence, there was no houses nearby, and regiments of soldiers used to bathe there. But houses had since been erected within the view of the place where the offence was committed. The defendant's counsel contended that, um, however commensurable the defendant might be, he was not guilty of an uh, indictable offence. The defendant had no criminal intention, bathing had not co had continued at this spot for many years, and the inhabitants of the new houses had come to, to the nuisance. Blah, 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 entertained no doubt that the defendant, by exposing his person, was guilty of a misdemeanour. The law would not tolerate such an exhibition, whatever the defendant's intention was. The necessary tendency of his conduct was to outrage decency and corrupt public morals. It was no justification that bathing a few years ago might the innocent, whatever a place becomes, whenever a place becomes the habitation of civilised men, the laws of decency must be enforced. Defendant found guilty. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that's lovely because you just kind of think, what is actually going on behind there? What, the, what, what is the real sort of narrative that this judge is actually sort of, you know, what's he picking up? What's he getting a, um, annoyed about? Um, this sort of nudity on the beach. Um, but obviously the prince wasn't around here forever, um, the railways came, the, the, the prince went, and so the soldiers. But the town, you know, partly because it's proximity to London, remained um, a centre for theatre and entertainment and relaxation, and you know, with all that entails. And because of that, one of the, one of the areas that we're really um, hoping to have in the exhibition is around performance and performativity. Um, and we've, we've actually got somewhere um, in the collection at a secret location, um, a balustrade or something from the original Palace Pier Theatre. Um, and I've, this isn't it, by the way, this is just from Google Images. Um, and, but I, I throw it up there because when I say we hope to have it, um, it's a consideration that we've, that we've had to look at as curators is that it might not be in a fit position to actually um, to use. It, it, it might actually need a lot of restoring, which might be expensive. And also, uh, we've got limited space up there. As I said, it's going to be a very busy exhibition. It might be too big for the exhibition. So this is one of the things that we're having to sort of think about when we're putting this exhibition together. Um, but um, having said that, there are things that we, we are sure we will be able to talk about um, in the performance section. Um, we'll be able to talk about Miss Vista Miss Tilly, the cross-dressing um, theatre performer from the 20s and 30s, I think. Um, Lisa's more of an expert than me. Um, we had a chap come in who was showing us some photographs of a, a group of, um, we can call them cross-dressed, call them um, female impersonators, ex-army female impersonators called La Rouge et Noir. Um, there's a poster of the VNA um, of them performing on the Palace Pier, which we want to get hold of, or at least a copy of. Um, that is, again, just a picture of Google. Um, and then we've also got very lucky that Maisie and also Dave Lynn are going to um, lend us um, some of their costumes um, from their drag shows. Um, and at this stage, I'm going to hand over to Lisa, because we, the umbrella of performance and performativity, it sort of extends into other areas, um, which Lisa is going to rush up and talk about. Um, I think it's worth giving you a context of the design, come on, Lisa, is that by recreating an imaginary queer peer space. We're creating an arcade space that can also be interactive. But we've got, if you've seen the Museum of Transology, there's three glass cabinets. They're very big, 
and they're fixed. So we need to work within that footprint of the gallery. So what we're thinking is that they become basically themed by a, a long pier theme. So one of them will be like a theatre, as we had down on the pier. One of them will be a house of horrors, and the house of horrors is the idea, that's where we'll put all our protest and um, information about violence and activism, for example, and we've got another one that we're still developing. So under theatre, this has really kind of become very much Lisa's focus. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Lisa. I'm, I'm actually a gallery explainer here, um, and i am um, just finished my first year of part-time masters at the University of Brighton, and um, I um, got the opportunity to come and uh, help volunteer with this, which it um, is a really nice two-way thing for me because I'm just starting to research my dissertation, which is actually about um, the erasure of the L word um, and the exploration of how um, mu uh, museums uh, represent lesbians within space. So um, I'm using this opportunity to feed into my dissertation as well. Um, so um, I thought it would be really interesting to look at women, specifically, hopefully, like lesbians, because we do tend to get ignored um, and um, the first thing I wanted to look at was Harriet Ethelson Dick which I think um, came up through um, some paperwork we had from Bright Now Story. So I um, did some looking on the internet and I managed to get some information and an email from a very nice chap from the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives um, and sent me a load of images from the State Library of Victoria, which are luckily out of copyright, so we can use them willy-nilly. Um, <laughs> the age of 50 years old unfortunately but she made her name here initially um, in Brighton England as um, an, an swimming instructress as it was put then in Brill Baths in Brighton and we have located some really interesting images of Brill Baths um, so we're hoping to include that um, and she undertook feats of swimming endurance that was only associated with men at the time um, and what she actually did, which was quite a, an in, quite an incredible feat at that time, was she swam shore to Brighton in rough seas, seas and um, it took two hours, 43 minutes. I've got an image of what she was wearing actually, but we'll come to it in a minute. Um, anyway, she had um, a lady friend called uh, Caroline Mercy Alice Moon, and she goes as Alice Moon. And um, she was quite from a wealthy background. I believe her father was a doctor. Um, I've got loads of information that the um, Australian uh, Lesbian and Gay Archives have sent me, uh, which was really kind of them. Um, and um, she and um, Harriet at some point went and emigrated and around about 1874 over to Australia and they set up a women's gymnasium and so this fantastic image shows uh, Harriet there in the centre and what she was actually wearing when she was swimming. Um, so it was quite quite a garment actually um, and he, I mean incredibly she was actually showing some bare leg um, which would have been quite unheard of. Um, lo looking at archive pictures of what Victorian women were wearing at that period, yeah. that would have actually been very risque. But she, you know, she needed not to wear too much material in order to be able to do these swimming feats. Amazing. Um, so this is at, um, this is swimming matches at St Kilda, which is in Australia, and her and Alice um, instructed women and girls. Um, in swimming activities and gym in the gymnasium. Which, yay! <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and this really helps inform the uh, the idea of the new woman, uh, because um, you know it's breaking women out of those domestic roles and saying to women, actually, you can be a lesbian. Yes. <laughs> sure. um, but you can take part in physical um, activity outside of the domestic realm. 
Um, so, you know, it's very pioneering work. Further into the story, and I don't want to reveal too much because I've, I'm, I, I buy books like nobody's business and I've got another book on order um, and it's coming out in, in June in this country. And it turns out that Alice unfortunately left Harriet. I know, boo. And uh, she went to move to Sydney um, and become a, a very successful author and journalist. But there's a twist in the tale because apparently Alice died at 37 from a heart attack in her bed. Oh. And um, there's suspicions that of a powerful chauvinistic scientist she was working with writing a book. Um, and they think he had something to do with her death. Well, and apparently her female friends built a wall of silence around it. Um, but they left a public accusation on her gravestone. And uh, th this woman, uh, Susan Ingleton, who's researched into the story, has just published a book. Um, so hopefully I might be able to sort of bring some of that story into the exhibition. And this is a really lovely image. Um, this, that's Harriet with, um, in, her, in her gym um, and uh, sh giving lessons in Indian clubs. And this was in Melbourne, in uh, Collins Street. Which is still, you know, probably one of the strongest haunts for lesbians in the whole of Melbourne, mm -hmm. actually, today. Mm -hmm. Interestingly. Yeah. Um, so, it's gone a little bit squiffy because mm -hmm. we've got some other information that um, kind of happened while I was on the bus today on our WhatsApp. So if I've had to insert something off, in between this but anyway while um we've been on our discussions about um not just historic people but um how that actually then transfers itself into the present day um i thought it was quite interesting how if we could like in some way incorporate um queers on the buses um there's uh, probably at least half a dozen names on the buses currently um, and that includes Phil Starr, um, Dusty Springfield and Aubrey Beardsley. And I think that's a really useful tool in, in, for um, generating this queer information to the general public. Um, and um, so you know, you're just sitting there maybe you know, looking at some newspaper and then suddenly look up and you know, find out about Aubrey, Aubrey Beardsley. <laughs> Um, but I think that's a really um, interesting way of feeding information through to the public without them really realising that they're, they're learning some sort of queer knowledge. The other thing that I also found um, is we have this painting by Christine Jones uh, that was created in 2002, which is an oil painting called Pride and Pride. And um, I don't know if anyone else knows about this person. Um, there's limited information on our our MIMSI system, which is our um, software database for, um, for our collection. So that would be really interesting if anyone else knows anything about her. So as Darren was talking, we were looking at performativity. Um, and so I'm really interested in the history of male impersonators. Uh, so famously, we've got Vesta Tilly that performed here. She performed at the Hippodrome and the uh, Palace Pier Theatre. Um, we also have um, the wonderful Dusty Springfield. She lived here in uh, Wil um, Wilbur Road in Hove at her parents' house during 1962 um, with her brother Tom, and that's where they got together to fit, um, form the Springfield, um, Springfield. So that would be quite nice to bring that in as a different element of how women um, present and display themselves in, uh, in performance. And, and it, it sort of goes across the generations of how that happened. Alf sent a WhatsApp message earlier to say that he'd found on Brighton our story uh, that Anne Lister actually came and stayed in Brighton for three days in 1826. So she actually um, came down here um, with her lover at the time, Marianne Lawton, and they were stranded here in August uh, for three days and they stayed in um, the York Hotel down at the, uh, the Steam, which is now the Royal York Buildings. And while they were there, they visited the, paint, the uh, Chain Pier and they uh, walked along to Marine Parade and Kent Town. And um, it actually states that Marianne was sick all over Anne in the bed after drinking too much water. 
I don't think that's a euphemism. I think she probably was taking the waters. Um, but then it says that in the morning, there was coded entries. So she obviously recovered from sickness and, uh, and uh, uh, they had an enjoyable morning together in bed. Um, but um, I think this is uh, quite interesting and also very, con obviously, contemporary because we have Gentleman Jack that just started recently. And so, um, and also because um, Anne Lister has that uh, now being the title of the first modern lesbian, um, it also brings in the idea about how women are perceived and labelled um, in history um, and uh, brings in that idea of the um, erasure of lesbian history and trying to refine refine, um, refine it and redefine um, women. And it brings in the, the fact that actually recently um, the um, Holy Trinity Church in York had their blue plaque changed. It was the first rainbow plaque and unfortunately brought a lot of controversy because um, it came up saying that she was gender non-conforming and the whole L word was completely erased off the plaque. Um, and I'm delighted, delighted to see that actually it now does state that she is a lesbian. She was a lesbian and a diarist. I think that's very interesting. Well, I became interested how there's very little visibly non-normative bodies associated with this work that we're doing. And um, I was very really fortunate to come across some of you know our house work in, in promoting the Hilton sisters who were two conjoined twins in, in the film The Freaks, which is a very short amount of clip of them, but there is, there is visual representation of them historically. Um, I've been researching, and some of you may know, he's um, campaigned to have a blue plaque put up where they were, where they were born, which is up. Um, but also, I'm over here to, um, to uh, present some of his work about the Hilton sisters because it's their, their non normative bodies and representation of them in our discussion. I uh, just randomly got interested in the Hilton sisters, Violet and Daisy Hilton, because um, they were in the film Freaks um, from 1932, which is a black and white movie uh, which is set in um, a sideshow and basically all it's a. It's a it's a, it's a tale. Um, uh, everybody in it uh, were people uh, with disabilities, with unusual bodies, um, the people from Sideshow, so they weren't um, actors in makeup and, and prosthetics and stuff, mm. um, which was really shocking for its day. Um, and it came out in 1932, and they instantly edited it in America, and it caused a big scandal, um, and it got banned over here for 30 years. I, I, I got interested because I, I didn't know they were born in Brighton. Uh, 18 Riley Road, so if you go up Bear Road, it's the first on the left. Um, and I, I thought they should have a plaque, so last year I contacted the plaque people and they said, yes, we know about them, but nobody's ever nominated them. So I thought, well, I've got to do it now, haven't I? So I nominated <laughs> them. I then found out that uh, it cost over a grand to have a plaque, you have to raise the money. So I did some more research and did some walking tours and I got the money and the plaque's going out April next year. Um, <laughs> um, the bottom bit of the image is cropped off, but uh, this is one of the postcards that you could buy um, of the twins. They were born in Riley Road, and then the midwife, uh, Mary Hilton, ran the Queen's Aunt pub in George Street in Brighton. Uh, she was the landlady, but also a midwife, and often her staff were young pregnant girls. Um, who couldn't afford a doctor, so they'd work for her for some shifts and then she'd go and deliver their baby. Uh, she went to Ethel Skinner's delivery and Ethel had Violet and Daisy Hilton, Violet and Daisy Skinner. Uh, what year was this time? This was 1908, yeah. Uh, Ethel Skinner freaked, basically. Um, you know, she was 21, she was unmarried. Uh, having a kid with a disability of any sort at that point would have been like a mark against your, your moral character. She also um, was living at home with her parents. So Mary Hilton took the kids on and initially everybody thought, you know, that, that's a great thing to do. Um, she then basically for a couple of decades exploited them. Uh, and within a couple of weeks, you could go to the uh, Queen's Arms 
um, and by a postcard, but you could also go to the back room and lift up the gowns where the twins were joined and touch where they were joined and stuff. Um, so they were in Brighton for about three years, um, a year and a half at the Queen's Arms, then a year and a half at the Evening Star up by the train station. Uh, they then went on to America and became massive stars. They were in the film Freaks. Um, there aren't many, they, they were massive vaudeville stars um, in America, uh, had their own independent careers and didn't really consider themselves freaks. So they weren't really sure about doing this movie and they kept themselves quite separate from the rest of the cast. So there aren't very many pictures of them in the film. Um, I mean, with the rest of the cast or any stills, but you can see they, they could sing, they could dance, they could play musical instruments. Um, you can see them there, both playing the saxophone at the back there. They came to Brighton in 1933 after Freaks kind of was a massive flop, really, because no one wanted to see it because it was all too disturbing for that time. Um, so they came and they performed Four Nights at the Hippodrome. Are we going to guess that they might have gone later here? A bit tenuous, but there we go. Um, you might be wondering why we're including them, um, where the kind of queer story comes in. Um, Violet got married twice, uh, both times it seems for publicity. Uh, the first uh, time was to the band leader Maurice Lambert. The second time was to Jim Moore, who was once described as gay as a rag. Uh, <laughs> that was in 1936. And in 1941, this you can see uh, Daisy, is holding the arm of Buddy Sawyer, um, who was a dancer, and uh, he did a runner before the honeymoon. Um, yeah, he doesn't look gay at all, does he? <laughs> with queer history, you have to read between the lines a certain amount. Um, and with Violet, the fact that she was quite happy to get married more than once purely for publicity um, possibly indicates that she wasn't that interested in men, which may seem like a bit of a leap, but one of the carnival operators who knew them uh, apparently was, was, was quoted with saying, too bad, only one of them went for the boys. So yes. we have a kind of question mark over, over Violet's sexuality. We've got a little uh, film clip of a trailer, because they made two films, Freaks and Chain for Life. Uh, Chain for Life was um, kind of an exploitation movie, and this is just the trailer for it, so it's only a couple of minutes long. I want to be free. Now I know that the only way I can be happy is to be alone with a man I love. The kind that say they don't fall, fall the hardest of all. So never, never, no, never, never, never say you'll never fall in love. I love you. Here is the strangest of love stories. You are in love with him. Yes. And he's in love with me. I do now pronounce you man and wife. The strangest marriage the law has ever permitted. And the strangest of all bridal nights. And because of Rene, whom few men could resist, the strangest of triangles. Suppose I told him the truth. About what? About us. Murder that baffled justice. A case that has no precedent in the history of the courts. Because until death, they are chained for life. So, um, it kind of brings us up to the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and that's where, in terms of um, looking for actual genuine proof evidence, we start to get um, more LGBT um, IQ plus history. Specifically, um, thanks to Brighton Our Story Project and the oral histories, we've got um, lots of stories of, of um, men and women in the 50s and 60s growing up in Brighton or living in Brighton, um, the gay experiences. And um, what we've what we found, I uh, just wanted to like just touch on some of the bits and bobs that we've um, come across at, at, um, at the Keep specifically. Um, which I think are, are really interesting. Um, I talked actually last month about um, the service that bookshops like Public House Books and Unicorn Books did for the lesbian and gay community. Before the internet, they were great places, or almost the only places where you could actually go and um, meet other people like yourself. And some of the uh, magazines that were published in-house or um, uh, sort of associated places were the first 
um, places where you could actually get positive uh, messages about lesbian and gay people. Um, so we've got um, lots of these in the archive at Brighton University, so we'll be uh, funny through some of those. I'm um, really, really, really fascinated by uh, this publication that's part of um, ALF's uh, personal collection, a magazine called uh, Queer Tribe. And as you can see, a radical community publication for lesbian and gay men. I think this was sort of mid 80s, 89, 89 and all Brighton based. Um, I won't go into that story with the, the picture there, but it's um, you have to come to the exhibition to read about that one. Um, this really made my heart stop beating uh, when we found this. This is a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a document describing a sort of a description a year on after the formation of the GL, the Gay Liberation Front in Sussex. That's 1972, but it's talking about 1971. And as you can see, the top says just a little different. I won't read the whole thing out, but it's, it's a bit of a history of the sort of the 12 months, and it actually talks about how they'd been moved from various places to have their meetings, and they, 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 they managed to secure um, a meeting room in a church uh, by a friendly vicar, and then when the congregation found out, they were booted out. Um, and it's a sort of, a, it's, 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 you know, very sort of, um, uh, matter of fact or sort of discussion of the foundation of a really um, important um, organisation which went on to um, to organise the very first gay pride um, march or it wasn't called that in the day. It says they're not writing but hoping to get a photo. We've got a friend of a friend who actually has the only genuine photograph of the um, uh, Gay Liberation from uh, March in Brighton in 1973 and we're hoping to be able to get that for the exhibition. Um, this is another one of um, from our collection. <coughs> this and um, this banner, which uh, you saw in that photograph I showed earlier, which um, is uh, the Sussex response to against Clause 28. Um, and you, you, how did you come across this? It was... uh, well, I was part of the group that helped design that one. Uh -huh. the, um, and I, I just I discovered it down the side of a tent one, one, one early, very early Pride, um, being urinated on. Um, <laughs> well, about to be. So I, I grabbed it. And it has been washed. Yes. Um, and um, the response, the Sussex response to um, HIV and AIDS. Um, this is a real, I'm just I'm going to read this out because this I think is really moving. It's, a, it's an account of some testimonials of people's experience in the 80s of, 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 of you know, the first sort of um, wave of, of HIV and AIDS. And I'll read that one. He's, he was in a ward with eight other beds. They, they obviously sussed out we were gay. And so we had this abuse, queer fucking pups and that sort of stuff. When someone you love is dying, you really need to hold them, and you, can, and you can't because you're in a ward full of heterosexuals who are hurling abuse at you. No one had bathed him for a week, he was in a bed covered in blood, and not one person would touch him. And I think, you know, when you read that, in nowadays, 20 odd years later, it really brings back how frightening the whole thing was. Um, again, something, uh, more stuff from Alf's collection, um, Lesbian Safe Sex Guides, uh, Safe Sex Sussex and T-shirts. Um, and this cabinet, again, that EJ touched on, we, because we've got a ghoul mask from the original ghost trade on the pier, we thought we would theme one cabinet about House of Horrors, where we would talk about um, not just the protests, but also the persecution that um, our community has been through. And anyone who's here last month, um, I'll give a really um, brilliant talk about the, um, what they call you know, lances, and uh, the Sussex sort of uh, response to the um, the spanner operation which was clamping down on uh, gay men um, having sex in their own homes completely legally. Um, and so we might touch on that. And then myself and EJ, when we were at the keep, we came across this sampler, which is from a trans... This big, it's about this big, and it's hand, hand embroidered. You can see that we have some gaps in the exhibition. There's very little trans content so far, um, but we're up there. And um, she's based at the Lewis prison. Um, she's made it herself. She talks about the fact that she's in a man's prison and that she's being kept there for life. Um, and it was part of a project called Beyond Boxes and it's on display up at the keep at the moment. So we're going to get in contact with those organisers and see what we can do about going to visit her, possibly, and record a story or certainly include it as part of the story. It's very much part of Brighton and, and, and Sussex's local history now, um, but it has a long history of you know, the complexity of, of imprisonment surrounding our sexualities and our genders. So as you can see, it's, it really does bring it right up to date. Um, obviously it's not going to be the most cheery cabinet, I have to admit, but we're obviously going to have um, it represented in there. And you know, I think by the 90s, the ephemera that we've got at the keep 
um, is much more upbeat. Um, first uh, Pride for, for a couple of decades in 1992. Um, actually, this is from Al's collection, not from the Keep. Um, and there, at this point, we've got lots of stuff that we can put in there to show sort of the response, the renewed acceptance and celebration of sexuality. So Club Shame at Zap, the Lesbos Rise again. I love the, the subheads on this, on this article. I won't read the article, but it says, Orgy, make it happen, recession. Um, Queer on the Pier, this was a, a campaign to get people to get to, to, to go and um, show their presence on what was quite a sort of a, uh, a, a straight sort of experience back then. Um, again from Mouse Collection, this is a wonderful waistcoat that was made specifically for wild fruit. Um, Shameless Hosses, another um, nightclub and collection of badges. And we, we were going to show this, but because we're running short on time, so we're just going to cut this. But um, if you want to go and see that, it is, it is on YouTube and it is absolutely brilliant. I think the thing that really strikes me about this, this, this actual um, 10 minute film that Alf took in 1994 is how shell shocked we all look. There's virtually no one, also, there's virtually no one on the side of the street watching us. And it looks like we're all absolutely terrified and can't wait to get to the park. Um, and it's, 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 you know, it's the contrast to today is, is just phenomenal. Um, obviously, I think I talked earlier about some of the, the stars, some of the more celebrity type people that have been really associated with this town. So you know, we want to have a space in there um, around the artists, the writers, um, the, 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 the painters um, that have, that have con you know, contributed to, you know, to, to their spheres, but have all um, come from Brighton or been drawn to Brighton. Um, there's a, quite a lot of stuff in the collection to do with all the Beardsley, which is really exciting. They've got every copy of the Yellow Book, which is super exciting. If you don't know who Aubrey Beardsley is, basically um, he completely re sort of um, you know re injected enthusiasm and excitement into Victorian um, design. He illustrated a play for uh, Lysandra, I think it's called, and look how explicit that is. Um, in terms of whether Aubrey was gay, there's very little evidence to actually say definitively he was, but given the fact that he was an associate of Oscar Wilde, and if you look at the Yellow Book, which he was the art director for, an awful lot of the contributors are people who are now known to have been um, homosexuals. Um, he tragically died at 25, so he probably never even you know, got to that stage where he wanted to um, be more open. Um, people that we do know, Okay, obviously Gluck, Flynn Philpott, Duncan Grant, and we've got examples of their work in the collection, so we want to be able to create a space for that. And very excited, recently we got, uh, got offered the typewriter of Peter Burton, who lived in Brighton for about 30 or 40 years, um, was a novelist in his own right, um, really sort of pushing boundaries in terms of um, gay journalism, and he was actually the literary editor for the Gay Times for 20 years. And we've been given, or we don't to take his, uh, his, his, his typewriter, which I've been told it was, he owned, that was the only thing he ever typed on. He never used a laptop. Everything he wrote was on this typewriter. So to have that in the, in the exhibition, I think would be really, really great as an opportunity to tell more of his story. Um, and which leads me to um, one of the things that we're going to be uh, doing as part of the exhibition is more interactive. So we want people who visit the exhibition to respond to it in writing or you know, whatever little pictures and then we're going to sort of move that into fanzine areas. So um, that's actually um, Adrian's speciality so We talked a bit about wanting to be making history as well as taking it and reclaiming it. And there's only so much that we can fit in the scope of our research and exhibition. But we want to have an area within the museum where people can sit down and write their thoughts, their own queer histories, their own hopes for queer futures. Um, and these will kind of be collected monthly and put together into a little zine. Um, this is also going to be in a section of the museum, which will be a kind of library set up for people who want to look further into queer history in the area. So we'll have kind of published books as well as more DIY content, other people's zines. And um, we'd also like to have documents from our own process because there's going to be lots of information that we won't be able to fit, kind of things that are 2D and won't look so good on kind of in a big display cabinet. We'd like people to still be able to see them if they want to do more in-depth research. So we'd like to have a set of resources as well so it becomes a space where people um, can start their own research and look at all the different tiny little branches that we have of our history in this town. Janet, why don't you share? I found a bench. <laughs> <laughs> this is, the, the bench is basically from the pier. So I have located one. If things go to plan, we'll be getting it. and we'll be So she won it on eBay yesterday. Yeah, so <laughs> so that's, that's the big news. We've got a, we've got a pier bench. And that will be our, our seating area yeah, for so our library. To sit on the bench, experience the <laughs> comfort of sitting on a pier bench, mm -hmm. and write your, uh, your responses to the exhibition.